The letter of 1 Peter was written around 64 AD in Rome for an audience of Gentile Christians who were exiled throughout the northern areas of Asia Minor, or modern-day Turkey. The reality these believers faced of being scattered throughout foreign lands serves as the building block for a reminder from Peter that this world is not our home. This letter was written during a time of intense persecution of Christians, yet we see Peter calling on believers to conduct themselves, remember there's hope in the midst of suffering, and most importantly, pointing us back to the ultimate example we must follow as Christians, Jesus. Peter calls for us to have set apart lives where we remember our identity in Christ, to live differently than the standards of the world around us so that they can see Jesus through our lives. Join us as we open our Bibles and take a deep dive into the letter of 1 Peter. Good morning, Mission Point Church. How is everybody? Are you dry? Are you at least a little dry? I remember seeing Pastor Rich, I, he was soaked, his whole shirt soaked. I go, where were you? He goes, I'm just holding the umbrella, helping people get into the church. And I'm like, wow, after a week at camp, I don't know how you did it. You know, my name is Bob Hellyer, and I'm one of the elders here, and I've been given the privilege today to speak with you from the Word of God. Uh, as you saw from the Bumper video, Josh made that, our Director of Communications, and uh, I thank you, Josh, for a great background on our uh, study today. I want to share a story about a man who was having difficulty communicating with his wife. After a while, he determined that his wife had become hard of hearing. Now, please remember, it's no one here at this church that I'm talking about. No one here at all. But so the guy wanted to do, uh, to do a little test without his wife knowing about it, just to make sure. So while he was stand, uh, sitting all the way on the other side of the room, she was sitting in the dining room with her back to him, and he whispers, can you hear me? There was no response. He moves across the living room just a little, and he goes, can you hear me now? Still no answer. Now he gets into the dining room, fairly close, and there's still no response. Finally, he walks right up behind her back, and he goes, can you hear me now? To his surprise, in an irritated voice, she said, for the fourth time, yes, I hear you. <laughs> well... Just starting off, today we're going to be talking about communication as we look in this, uh, into the book of 1 Peter, not only in what we say, but how we act. How should we communicate and interact with those fellow believers? How should we interact with those who have no faith system at all? And how should we respond when the circumstances in our life treat us unfairly. When the Apostle Paul wrote this in 63 AD, Christianity was just starting to grow in that area of northern Turkey for about 30 years. The believers were beginning to experience significant social and cultural rejection as a result of their faith in Christ. While it was not yet formal or fatal, Greater persecution was coming, and Peter wanted to make sure the church there was prepared. You know, that area had been under Roman rule for about a hundred years, and Emperor Nero was starting to get concerned. Peter wanted to encourage these early young believers to live out their faith in a way that pointed others to the Savior. You know, Peter was part of Jesus' inner circle for three years, and he wanted to share what he experienced being in the presence of Jesus. He wanted to help them maintain a Christian attitude and witness no matter what their circumstances were. And you know, his message is just important to us today here at Mission Point. As we interact with each other as believers, as we work through all the difficulties that life has to offer, and as we deal with people who don't have a faith system, 
To be honest with you, the more I reflected on my life, the more I realized how short I fell at living out these principles. I'm constantly saying to myself, you know, I need more of you, God, and less of me. So just know, living out these virtues we're going to be going over today can't be done in our own power as much as we try. It's only when a person admits their inability to meet God's standard and puts their faith in Jesus Christ that God empowers them through the indwelling Holy Spirit and the ability to carry out Peter's calling. The key as we've been going over, submission to the Savior is the key. So today we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going over four verses, verses 8 through 12. So as you're getting to your text, I want to share a current interesting fact about that area of northern Turkey. There, uh, as This past year, they were put number 50 on the worldwide watch list of most persecuted church uh, countries in the world, as uh, said through opendoors.org. While their persecution was considered very high, their uh, violence was low, but every other layer of life was really high. So just like it was back in Peter's day, Turkey, that area of Turkey is just about the same. So before we start, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for gathering us together, even on this rainy, stormy day. You have brought us here to hear your word. As we go through the truths that we're studying today, May you help us to grow closer to you in living out our faith and be an example to the world around us. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's look at those verses now, starting with verse 8. It says, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, But on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to live life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So we're going to spend the bulk of our time in that very first verse, verse 8. And if we can cultivate these virtues in our lives and show not only by our words, but also our actions, our obedience to God and our submission to authority, it will provide a powerful witness to a life that's committed to the one true God. Let's look at verse 8 there. It says, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. So that first word there, finally, is the Greek word telos, which means to sum up. So because it's in the present tense, it doesn't mean that Peter is summing up this entire book, right? Because we still have two chapters left. But what he's summing up is what he had just talked about concerning submission. In chapter 2, it started verse 13. If you guys will remember before our beat services, uh, our care pastor, Chris Jones, shared a little bit about submitting to authority. Then when we got back from the beaches, Pastor Rich shared for these past two weeks one week on submitting to our bosses, and then last week about wives coming under the leadership of your husbands. So if you missed any of these messages, you could go on to our website, mymissionpoint.com. So basically what this summary says, it says, live your life in word and deed with the following attributes or virtues, and not only will you be a prosperous, growing church, but an example to the world what a people dedicated to the Creator looks like. So let's look at that first virtue, unity of mind. It's the Greek word for harmonious, which is 
homophron. It's a combination of two words, homos, which means one and the same, and friend, meaning mind or understanding. It's literally of one and the same mind or having a common mindset. Now, please note that unity of mind does not mean uniformity, but it means cooperation in diversity. It doesn't mean we all have the same tastes, or we all have the same gifts, or even we all have the same habits. So we may differ in how things are to be done, but we must agree on what is to be done and why. The idea is that we are to possess the same thoughts and assessments of the essentials in life concerning God, salvation, and virtue. It was once said, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, love. Look at what Paul says to the early church in Philippi, chapter 2. He says, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. And Jesus, as our ultimate example, in his high priestly prayer to the Father, looks what he says in John 17. He says, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as you loved me. Perfectly one in Christ, so that the world may know. It's sort of like Dakota and the worship team up here, which Dakota, great job today. Each person plays a different instrument. Each person has a different responsibility, but yet when you bring them all together, beautiful music. We're like maybe our church softball team, which, by the way, won our first games last Monday. I know, but like that, you have 10 players, right? All have a different responsibility, all working together for one goal, to win a game. So how are we doing, church, at unity of mind? Does our attitudes and actions contribute to or detract from the harmony here at Mission Point Church? How about if you think about it, how does the unity of mind work in our marriages? How about in our families or even in our workplaces? It's something to think about. Unity of mind is important, but the second virtue is sympathy. Look at what uh, New Testament Greek scholar Kenneth Weiss says about sympathy. He says it's made up of two Greek words, one word meaning to be affected by something, hence to feel, that is to have feelings stirred up within one by some circumstance, the other word meaning with. So the word means, therefore, to have fellow feelings, it refers to the interchange of fellow feelings, note, in either joy or sorrow. It is to rejoice with them that do rejoice and to weep with them that weep, as in Romans 12, 15. The English word sympathy refers to the fellow feeling we should have with those that suffer. But in the Greek, that's the secondary meaning. The primary meaning it, uh, refers to a fellow feeling with a Christian brother either in joys or in his sorrows. It takes much more grace sometimes to rejoice with another saint in the way God has blessed him as it does to sympathize with someone that is in sadness. Sympathy is feeling what others feel so you can respond with sensitivity to their circumstances. A similar word is compassion, which is sympathy in action. To have true sympathy, you know, you wouldn't say to someone, I know how you feel. Because, because you know how they feel, that you know how unhelpful it is to say to somebody, I know how you feel. Look at what Paul says to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 12. 
He says that there, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. As one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. You know, Jesus showed true sympathy when he fed the multitude in Matthew 14, when he went to raise Lazarus from the dead in John 11, and when he healed the woman with a disabling spirit in Luke 13. Now, our care pastor, Chris Jones, who I mentioned earlier, is living out that example of Christ. As our care ministry is ramping up, Chris continues to look for individuals whose hearts are sensitive to the needs of others, not only spiritually, emotionally, but physically. There's so many ways that you could be involved in this care ministry guys. You know, there's meal trains, there's visitations, there's grief share ministry, marriage ministry. There's so many ways that you can connect. So if God is tugging at your heart in this area, please see Chris after the service. He'd welcome you in and can find just the right place for you to be. So the third virtue that we're talking about is brotherly love. Most of you guys know that. The Greek word for that is philadelphos, which we get the word Philadelphia from. That's why they call it the city of brotherly love. It's a friendship type of love. This love is called the philia type of love. And C.S. Lewis's website, he talks about the four types of love. And listen to what he says about the philia type of love. It says, to the ancients... Friendship seemed the happiest and most human of all loves. The crown of life, the school of virtue. The modern world, in comparison, ignores it. Why? Perhaps we know it's the most consuming type, the least celebrated, and the one we could live without. Perhaps, too, as Lewis says, few value it because few experience it. Lewis thinks friendship likely has closest resemblance to heaven, where we will all be intertwined in our relationships. We develop a kinship over something in common, and that longing for camaraderie makes friendship all the more wanted. Lewis says, friendship must be about something, even if it were only about enthusiasm for dominoes or white mice. Those who have nothing can share nothing. Those who are going nowhere can have no fellow travelers. You know, this virtue takes time to cultivate and has been difficult for me to embrace in my life. My life has always been very busy. I've always had a lot of responsibilities that occupy a lot of my time, as many of you know. In my striving, in life to be all things to all men, I've often missed out on the blessing of experiencing true brotherly love. Look at how Jesus shows philia type of love in John's gospel. He says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from the Father, I have made known to you. So as you heard earlier from when Rich was doing the announcements, Mission Point is actually living out these virtues in our summer hangouts. Guys, I encourage you to get there. Our summer hangouts or a way to be involved in a like-minded activity, spending time growing in your relationship with God and with each other. You can also, as he said, find them on mymissionpoint.com. But I got to tell you something. I just looked this morning. I thought I'd find them, but I saw no groups for dominoes or white mice. (laughs) Sorry about that. Peter's fourth virtue, a tender heart. The Greek word is, wait for it, eusplachnos. 
Now, I know, I love saying that, you splachnos. I had to learn that, it took a while. But you know, it's not a word about our outward conduct, but it's a word about our inners. It's this area, our stomach, our liver, and like our upper intestine area here. Literally, the Greek translation means to feel generous, feel generous in your belly. So that's what they're trying to get across there. And it's only found one other place in the entire New Testament, and that's in Ephesians 4, verse 32. Paul shares with the struggling church in Ephesus, where he says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. So listen to what British author uh, J.H. Joette said. He's from the 1900s, a scholar, and he, had, he wrote a book called The Epistles of Peter. Listen to what he says about tenderheartedness. He says, it carries one a step further than compassion. Tenderheartedness is more than correspondence. It's a gentle ministry. It includes the service of a tender hand. It not only feels the pains of others, it touches the wounds with exquisite delicacy. You know, when others sense that we generally care for them from our hearts, and feel our tender concern, you know, it opens up avenues for communication and interaction. Tenderheartedness is love in action. It sees other people's problems and helps to work to resolve them. You know, Jesus' tenderheartedness moved him to feed the hungry, heal the sick, And ultimately, he gave his life that we might have a way to get back in a right relationship with God. As we submit daily to the Lordship of Christ, he will use us to impact the lives of others. Let's look at the final virtue. Peter shares is humble in spirit. Now, if you thought that word, you splachnos, was a difficult word. This Greek word is tapenophrones. When you say tapenophrones, easy, right? Took me about 30 times to get it. Literally, it means lowly of mind. In the New Testament, this word describes a quality of voluntary submission and unselfishness. It's the opposite of pride and arrogance. You know, when you think about it, these first four virtues that we talked about are easier to apply to our walk when we truly understand this last one. So what's it mean to be humble in spirit? You know, it's a heart attitude. True humility produces godliness, produces contentment, and produces security. It's acknowledging that we are nothing in and of ourselves, and it's only because of his grace and his calling on our life that we are anything of worth. Look at what Paul says to the church in Philippi. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. And then Jesus in Matthew 11, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest in your souls. That lowly in heart is tapionophrones. So did we notice a common thread in any of these five virtues? First, they all describe Jesus, right? We went over that. Jesus fills every one of these virtues. And even hard-headed Peter saw these attributes in Jesus and knew he needed to share them with these struggling churches. And second, they all describe our character, who we are, on the inside, expressed by our actions. You know, I fail miserably when I let the flesh and the world get in the way of what God wants to do in me and through me. So I need to be dependent on and constantly aware of the indwelling Holy Spirit in my life to live this kind of life. Let's move on to verse 9. I told you we'd spend the most in 8, but we'll get through this. Do not repay evil for evil and reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may 
obtain a blessing. I wanted to put it also up here in the uh, Living Bible, too. Explains it a little better. It says, don't repay evil for evil. Don't snap back at those who say unkind things about you. Instead, pray God's help for them. For we are to be kind to others, and God will bless us for it. But Pastor Rich just two weeks ago shared a verse that perfectly complements this uh, from uh, chapter 2. It says, For this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and there was no deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Think about this just for a second. Peter, the guy who wrote these beautiful words right here in the Garden of Gethsemane, prior to Jesus' arrest, cut off Malchus's ear. And here we see a whole new Peter. If the promised Holy Spirit can change Peter's heart, he can do a similar work in ours too. What a difference the day of Pentecost made. Listen to what uh, Charles Spurgeon says about that. He says, you can always tell what man is like by noticing what comes from him. If he curses, it is because curses abound in him. But you are to give blessing to others because you have inherited so much blessing from Christ. Your whole tone, temper, spirit, language, actions should be a means for blessing, means of blessing to others. So how have we done this week? As I look back on my life, I struggled with that. Have our words and actions this week given evidence to our transformed life in Christ? Are people's, people nearer to receiving him as Savior as a result of having an encounter with each of us? Something to think about. A life of submission can not only be about what we receive from God, a blessing, but it has to be about what God receives from us, glory and honor. Let's finish these uh, last three verses here. It says, For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So Peter is quoting from Psalm 34 here, and David wrote these verses while fleeing from King Saul, who was trying to kill him. Most scholars believe that he wrote this while he was hiding out in the cave at Adullam. So Peter understands that David has some key truths here to help these early believers not only build a strong, uh, a strong church community while being persecuted, but having a positive impact on those around them. So I think in general, we all desire to have, to love life and to see good days, don't we? It speaks to living a life of peace and contentment in the life that God has given us, regardless of our outward circumstances. We can't do this on our own. Jesus says in John 6, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So guys, this involves both our words and our actions that we've seen today. We not only have to keep our words glorifying, not only in church, but on our way home when that guy cuts us off on the road, we need to not only do good while others are watching, but even when they aren't. Because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. So it's application time as we get ready to close. How do we implement these virtues in our lives? Well, I got two more words for you. They're not long. They're not in Greek. 
but they're the hardest words for me to live out. Submit and depend. Sound like two easy words, but that can only happen when we know who we need to submit to and who we need to depend on. We need to live a life surrendered to God through Jesus Christ and be dependent on the indwelling power of the Spirit in us. It's only then that we have the ability to be church, to be individuals that bring honor and glory to God. So if you're here today and you are a born-again believer, as we would say, that you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, not only for the forgiveness of your sins, but the gift of eternal life, I want to ask you, are you relying on his power to have unity of mind, to have sympathy, to have brotherly love, to have tenderheartedness, and to be humble in mind, or are you relying on your own power to do that? We live in a world now of self-reliance. We have so many resources in this world. We can do everything we want on our own. Everything is right at our fingertips. We don't need anybody else to live out our lives anymore. It's sort of like the wife in the story I talked about in the beginning. That wife is like God. God always hears us. But are we like the husband whose hearing is growing dim? Do we need to get closer to him to experience the power that we need to live out God's calling on our life? And maybe you're here and you haven't put your faith and trust in Jesus, which is what the church calls born again. I'm not real excited about that term. Sometimes it gets bad press, but it means when you come to a point in your life, when you realize you can't do this life on your own, that you need God and you need to understand what God did on your behalf through Jesus Christ. He bled and died on a cross because we have a sin nature that we've had from the beginning of time. It's a nature. Like think of you ever had kids and your kids are young. Did you ever have to teach them to be bad? You don't teach your kids to be bad. It's the nature that ends up. That's the nature that has to be cleansed, that can only be cleansed by putting faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And when you do that, this is the best part of all. Look at what Jesus says in John 14. He says, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. So understand that this isn't out there for them because it neither sees him or knows him. But once you put your faith in Christ, look to what it says, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. The power of the Holy Spirit is the key and will give you the ability to live out a life that brings honor and glory to God. So today could be your day. Before we close, I wanna offer an opportunity for you to experience God answering prayer. On the way out, do we have this coming up, guys? There you go. We made these bookmarkers and these bookmarkers are 1 Peter 3, 8. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. So grab one and challenge yourself when you leave here. Commit this to daily prayer, commit this to memorization, and every day submit to God and acknowledge your dependence on the power of the Holy Spirit and ask him to help you live out each of these virtues in your life. Don't be surprised when he answers your prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today and the time you've given us to look into your word. I ask that as believers, Lord, you help us to live out these virtues, that the world can see an example of what a person committed to the one true God looks like, that people may be drawn to you. And if there's any here today that you're tugging on their heart, Lord, because you say if people 
seek me, they will find me if they seek me with their whole heart. Those that are hungry for you now, I pray you meet them right where they are, that they confess that sin nature and put their faith and trust in you as the Lord and Savior. Lord, may we all live out a life that brings glory to you in all we do. In Christ's name we pray, amen.